Welcome to Living the Smarter Science of Slim, where we provide a scientifically proven lifestyle for long-term health and fat loss by eating more and exercising less, but smarter. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey everyone, Jonathan Baylor and Carrie Brown coming to you from Seattle, Washington, where we are living the smarter science of Slim. Carrie, how are you on this fine Tuesday? Well, um, it, it's, good to well. Be, it, 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 it's good to be back. We skipped a week last week because we were all running all over the place, and so it's good to be back. It is good to be back, and hopefully we can pick up right where we left off because I believe the week prior in, in recording time, we were talking about sweeteners and how they're not so good. And we were saving the best in quotations, best slash worst for last. Too many confusing words in that statement. <laughs> and uh, basically we were gonna wait to talk about high fructose corn syrup until today. So we've got high fructose corn syrup on the agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit about a uh, simple form of philosophy known as pragmatism. And then we're gonna start to get into how to get our sanity back and start to shift the podcast more into the how do, we, how do we solve this? How do we be sane and then moving on to exercise? So it's going to be a good episode, I think. It is, and um, particularly because most people love their sweeteners. So it'll be interesting to hear what you got to say about that. Well, and the good news, and I think we alluded to this in the last podcast, was that uh, going sane isn't about never eating anything sweet again. It's about consciously choosing our sweeteners. So there are non-caloric, non-hormonally harmful sweeteners such as uh, stevia, uh, there's another one called Lohan Go, which I'm still not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly. It's a herb from China, both of which are fine, but there are certain sweeteners we just got to stay away from. Anything that has calories, anything. Like, I don't care if it's honey. I don't care if it's the agave syrup or have you heard of this? Which mm -hmm. is actually ironic yeah. because I believe that's 95 or 90% fructose, which is funny because high fructose corn syrup is only 55% fructose. <laughs> so people are like, I'm doing the healthy thing by doing this. And actually, I'm like, you're taking in 40% more fruit. Anyway, so yeah, steer away from that. And so speaking you're hardcore. Of, I, well, ish. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, speaking of fructose, but no, let's let's kick the podcast off talking about this sweetener we hear the most about, and that is certainly high fructose corn syrup. So a little high fructose corn syrup 101 here today. So high fructose corn syrup, otherwise known as HFCS, is incredibly common and incredibly fattening. And the reason for that is it is very cheap and it is very sweet. So you combine those two things together and it of course becomes a ubiquitous ingredient in low calorie and low fat products. So it, it, so you say it's very sweet, so you're saying that we can get more sweet for less money. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, I mean, given the choice between making Coca-Cola or Pepsi with sugar and making it with high fructose corn syrup, you can raise your profit margin by making it with high fructose corn syrup. And that's interesting because when I moved from uh, England over here, in my beverage of choice used to be Dr. Pepper. In, in England, the Dr. Pepper is made with sugar, and in America, the Dr. Pepper is made with high fructose corn uh, syrup. And how is your Dr. Pepper habit going? It's, uh, it's gone. That's amazing. I just The reason I bring that up is I remember in our early podcasting <laughs> days, Carrie was, well, all, it was... All of two months ago. All of two months ago, <laughs> Carrie was like, Jonathan, I have to drink a Dr. Pepper. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. I just, I have to drink one. I have to. I'm sorry. And I'm just, it's just cool that eight weeks, you know, eight weeks later, you're just not even really wanting them. So that's great. Well, it's, you know, when you, when you understand the science, when you know what these things do to you, yep. you can almost like look at the can and just <laughs> see fat, you know, body fat, not good fat that we eat. But, you know, Absolutely. it's just like... I know for sure that if I drink the contents of that can, I am going to be fatter. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? And, and, and sicker, certainly. <laughs> certainly. Well, and, it's, and it's just not worth it. I mean, there's certainly there's certain things in life which are, which are worth it. Um, that might not be one of them, you know. So, okay, so back to high fructose corn syrup. So, folks, we always hear about this, and we should, because the amount of it we're taking in is just ridiculous. So, if you look at what we were eating in terms of high fructose corn syrup in the 1970s, Carrie, we're eating 10,475% more high fructose corn syrup today than we were in the 1970s. I, you know, I don't even remember hearing about high fructose corn syrup until I moved here 12 years ago. 
Yeah, well, no, I didn't really. I'll show these graphs in the show notes. But if you look since the 1970s, our total intake of caloric sweeteners like table sugar or glucose, high fructose corn syrup, like they're, the total sum is going up, but the percentage of the total caloric sweeteners that we're taking in that are coming from high fructose corn syrup is getting precipitously higher. So we're eating more sweeteners all up and we're eating way more high fructose corn syrup. And that is, I mean, obviously any caloric sweetener is bad. However, high fructose corn syrup is particularly harmful. Now I'm going to stress this and if you watch television or even if you watch Saturday Night Live because they did a parody of this, at some point in time, I don't think they're still running, there was, of course, like the National Corn Council or something ran ads on television being like, well, high fructose corn syrup is, is made from corn, which is natural, so it's fine in moderation. To be clear, folks, high fructose corn syrup has been scientifically proven to be more detrimental to your health than sugar. So whenever you see something on the news like sugar is toxic or is sugar a poison or you listen to the last podcast and we talk about how scientists knew as early as the 1950s that the correlation between sugar intake and coronary artery disease was stronger than the relationship between that and fat, high fructose corn syrup is worse for you. It's we, in everything, though. And, and if you start reading labels, it's in it, it, it's in a whole bunch of stuff that you would never even think that it was in. Oh, ab absolutely. And, and folks, I just really want to reiterate, like, it is not controversial in the scientific community that high fructose corn syrup is uniquely bad for you. For example, in rat studies where they would take rats and they would feed, you know, one group of rats table sugar and they would feed another group of rats a calorically equivalent uh, servings of high fructose corn syrup – the high fructose corn syrup rats consistently get fatter and sicker and the problem just gets worse. Beyond making us fat and sick, high fructose corn syrup, this is actually pretty crazy. It has, you remember we talked about sane foods, the, the S in sane stands for satiety, meaning how quickly a calorie fills us up and how long it keeps us full. High fructose corn syrup, carry. it doesn't have low satiety. Believe it or not, it has negative satiety. Now, what I mean by that is it causes a chemical change in your body, which makes you chronically hungrier than if you never ate it. Like uh, it's an appetite stimulant. Okay. That just blew the doors off the barn. <laughs> so no, not, seriously. Oh, it absolutely. Did because I mean, suddenly a whole bunch of weird things that you don't understand about your body just became yep. obvious. And this is what people, people want to say. And uh, I love this because people are like, oh, we're eating more. We're eating more. And what I always say is, well, we're eating more because we're eating the wrong quality of foods to begin with. High fructose corn syrup is a perfect example. If you eat a substance that makes you want to eat more, then you're going to eat more. And the problem is not you're eating more. The problem is the initial substance you put into your body that made you right. want to eat more. And again, right. Carrie, think about it from the food manufacturer's perspective. It's sweeter, it's cheaper, and it makes our customers want even more of those products. In my mind, I translate that, and you can slap me if I'm wrong, but I translate <laughs> Probably that Probably not going to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> it's addictive. Yep. If it's causing you to want to eat more, that in my mind is equals an addiction. Well, that was an awesome segue because, uh, in fact, researchers at Princeton University tell us, I'm quoting directly here, Laboratory rats given a high sugar diet and then withdrawn from sugar experience changes in both behavior and brain chemistry similar to those seen during withdrawal from morphine or nicotine. Related research reports, quoting again, we have clearly shown sugar addiction in rats causing brain and behavioral effects analogous to a little dose of amphetamines. In short, Carrie, you're exactly right. Clinical studies have shown that sweeteners are addictive to mammals. So... Lovely listeners, if that doesn't make you want to stop eating sugar, particularly high fructose corn syrup, and start reading those labels and just banning everything that's in it, I don't know what else we can tell you that'll make you want to stop. Absolutely. I mean, this, no one wants to be an addict. And once we can kind of put that, I mean, last week we talked a bit about how being healthy and, and slimming down becomes infinitely easier when we can attribute this to a noble motive. It's not about some superficial weight loss, although that is a nice side effect. When we cherish our bodies and we cherish our health and we wanna fuel ourselves and we wanna avoid, for example, becoming addicts to, to a, a food industry that is manipulating us, uh, that it, it makes it a lot easier. We have a lot more reasons to avoid it. But there's also, for me, a lot of hope in that, mm -hmm. in that it's not just that beating ourselves over the head because we can't control ourselves. Yep. 
there is something going on that is creating a, an urge to eat more of this stuff or an addiction to eat this stuff that once we've eaten it in the first place, we then lose control. Exactly. So it's not just that we are hopeless, stupid people not that all. have no willpower. Exactly. Once you've, it's, it's like stepping on a wet slide. Once you've stepped on the top, you lose control. That's a great analogy. And so, you know, but that's very hopeful to me. Absolutely. Because if you can just, if you just understand that if you step on that slide, that's where you're going to be. Yep then it's easier to not step on the slide. I, I couldn't agree more. And the other thing I want to inform our listeners of is, so the sweetener addiction is a proven phenomena. With any addiction, when you try to stop it, you're going to go through withdrawal. And you will experience that. So if you just flat give up sweeteners, uh, or and even go further and give up insane starch, you're going to go through withdrawal. You will have headaches. You will have low energy. That generally goes away within three days to extreme cases, two weeks. But here's the good news. It will only get easier. Give it two weeks and the rest of your life, it will be so much easier. It's going to feel bad and you're going to crave it. You're going to want it. I promise you in 14 days, it won't be like that anymore. Just give it 14 days. The other thing I found that was upping my protein helped enormously in stopping the cravings yep. enormously. Yep. So that really, really helped me. And I, the other thing is I've noticed is that when I have a moment where I, you know, go eat a crepe or you know, go eat a cupcake or whatever crazy thing I decide to do, mm -hmm. it's amazing how fast you're down the bottom of that slope. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's like that. Yep. It's just so much easier if you can just not go there in the first place. Absolutely. And that, and that's actually a good, just thinking more about the, the addiction withdrawal, the, the slippery slide, as Gary's referring to. If, if nothing else, when, when you start to move away from added sweeteners and starch and it feels bad, if nothing else, take that as a sign. I mean, you're going through withdrawal to me it can almost be motivational. Like this thing you're eating, it's conditioned you. Like it has in some ways taken over your brain and is causing you to lose control. That's why you're going through withdrawal. But the problem is that once you're there, it, it becomes even harder to step back because your body is then Absolutely. craving the stuff. So but, then it becomes yeah, and I, harder. And no, and I think my, my point was more the fact that you are going through withdrawal hopefully will be evidence that this is a toxic substance right. that you should be giving up. It is an addictive, poisonous substance. The fact that you go through withdrawal when you try to give it up is evidence of that, is my point, that I reached a, in a circuitous <laughs> route. So speaking of addictions, uh, I, one of the most powerful parallels I think we can draw to further uh, strengthen our minds when it comes to moving away from eating added sweeteners is comparing them to cigarettes. Now, one story that I love to tell took place in uh, 1998, and this is when Coca-Cola offered schools $10,000 to advertise Coke discount cards to their students. Now, a uh, high school in Augusta, Georgia, took Coke up on this and invited the Coke employees to lecture in classes. They actually added the analysis of Coca-Cola products to its chemistry curriculum. And then the school made all of the 1,230 students dress in red or white shirts and spell out Coke while they you know, got on top of the school and took photos to send to the Coke executives. Now, considering, Carrie, how harmful and addictive sweeteners are, why was the Coke stunt considered harmless fun while if like Philip Morris came into that school and started handing out tobacco discount cards, you know, we spelled out Marlboro, that would be against the law. But the tobacco thing is not only not a problem, it was just like, oh, it's fun. Like, woo, drink Coke, it's fun. And it just goes to prove to me anyway, how badly we have been misinformed and misguided. I don't know. I don't think you were paying attention, but when you were reading that paragraph, I was sitting here and my mouth was open. I was just like, <laughs> that is just, if you understand about the whole sugar thing, it's just yep. like, how do we get to that place where we're allowing that to happen? When, and listeners may, hopefully they're not, but some listeners may be thinking, this is, this is silly. Comparing sweeteners to tobacco is like comparing cigarettes to crack. Like clearly there's a, there's a significant difference here, but I, I, I'm going to venture that there isn't. Uh, if you look at the statistics, for example, in terms of death rate or mortality, I love this. Tobacco has been linked to about 435,000 deaths per year. Uh, insane starch and sweetener foods have been linked to 400,000. So there's an 
8% difference there. In addition to that, the World Health Organization has found that over worldwide, there are over 40 million overweight children that are under the age of five. Like, we not only look at deaths, when we look at uh, impact on GDP that obesity and overweight are having, these things are analogous. And then if you go one layer deeper and start to look at children, right, because we aren't giving children tobacco and cigarettes, but we do continue to feed children. And in fact, it breaks my heart, but in many ways, kids' food, like when we think of kids' food, it's defined by foods that contain a lot of sugar and starch. Like that's what makes kids' foods kids' food. It's insane. It's horrible for you. And if you think about it, that is so twisted and wrong. I mean, our children are the people who need the most nutrition. So the fact that a kid's menu basically means crap food is a nutritionally vapid food is just so heartbreaking. But it also sets them up for the addiction. Absolutely. It doesn't even set them up. It creates it. Right. Right. I mean, it's uh, this is a kind of a silly analogy, but I had a, uh, a black lab when I was growing up, and I love dogs. I can't wait to get one of my own here when we uh, move out of my teeny tiny condo that my wife and I live in. And my parents would always tell me, my dog's name was Silver, and they say, Jonathan, do not feed Silver people food. Do not feed Silver people food. And I was like, why? I was like, if you feed Silver people food, it won't want dog food anymore. And I don't mean to like <laughs> make kids analogous to dogs, but in some ways, right, if we put this crazy chemical mess that has been engineered to stimulate the release of dopamine in our brain, much like drugs are. Yeah, funny, they won't want lettuce. They won't want <laughs> lettuce, and it's gonna taste bad, but Carrie, you can attest to this, I can attest to this. Go into the Smarter Science of Slim community or their Facebook page, ask around, you'll find hundreds if not thousands of people that can attest to this. Once you break that addiction, Things like non-starchy vegetables and low-sugar fruits will taste better to you than any of these artificial junk products ever did. And I've also found, that is absolutely true for me, but I've also found that sweet things taste a gazillion times sweeter than they ever used to and sweeter than I want to eat. I mean, I exactly. just, I'm like, wow. Yeah, a good analogy for that is uh, if, if you're an individual who at one point in time drank whole milk or 2% milk and then started drinking skim milk, if you've ever tried to then go back to whole or skim milk, it'll taste foul. Same thing with diet soda and regular soda. Like if you're used to diet soda and then you try to drink regular soda again, it will taste bad. You can train yourself to like or dislike certain foods. You just got to give it 21 days. So but, I'm the opposite with milk, I've got to tell you. Oh, you like the, uh, which, which? Full fat. Oh, the full, oh, full fat milk yes. accent? I mean, you God, the skim milk here is like drinking coloured water. <laughs> well, I, I don't anyway. drink either, but I digress. <laughs> I digress. I don't drink either, either. But anyway. <laughs> so just going back a little bit, I want to spend a bit more time for anyone out there who still thinks it might be a little silly to compare sweeteners to cigarettes because I do think it is a very useful analogy. Um, it's also fascinating to note how the same people or the same companies that sell us tobacco – are in many ways the companies that sell us these high fructose corn syrup and sugar saturated food products. Let me let me give you a brief history here. And again, this isn't controversial, this isn't secret, but actually these companies don't want you to know about it. So let's 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 do a little whistleblowing here, Carrie. So Philip Morris, we all know, is a leading tobacco producer, but we're gonna find out they're also a leading quote unquote edible product producer. So in 1970, Philip Morris bought Miller Brewing. In 1978, they bought 97% of the 7-Up. R.J. Reynolds, another tobacco company, bought Nabisco Foods in 1985. Philip Morris then bought General Foods in 1985 as well. In 1988, they went on to buy Kraft. In 1990, they acquired Jacob Suchard. And in 1993, they buyed Nabisco Cereals. And in 2000, they bought all of Nabisco's holdings. So they own the whole freaking world. So basically, if it is an insane food, there is a very good chance it is being produced by the same people who stock your cigarette shelves. Wow. So, I had no idea about that. But actually, Carrie, from an evil mastermind perspective, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense because we could use our brilliant marketing strategies that we use for tobacco now on insane food-like products. Let me give you an example here. So here's how the tobacco industry describes the safety of their products. So this is a quote coming from the uh, president of the Philip Morris Tobacco Company. I believe nicotine is not addictive. Okay, hold on, don't, don't laugh yet. Here's a quote from the National Soft Drink Association. Soft drinks do not cause pediatric obesity, do not reduce nutrient intake, and do not cause dental cavities. 
Okay, well let's let's I keep have a going. Question. Let's keep no, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. They also share the same marketing tactics. So here's the Lorillard Tobacco Company. Quote: The base of our business is the high school student. Now here's the vice president of McDonald's. We always always have kid related programs. Two more, Carrie. Two more. Finally, on the health impact of their products. So from the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, we believe the products we make are not injurious to health. From Coke CEO, actually, our product is quite healthy. Fluid replenishment is key to health, and Coca Cola does a great service because it encourages people to take in more and more liquids. Finally, from the Tobacco Research Committee again, we accept an interest in people's health as a basic responsibility, paramount to every other consideration in our business. And then from the National Soft Drink Association, the soft drink industry has a long commitment to promoting a healthy lifestyle for individuals, especially children. Okay, so either these people are all smoking crack, <laughs> or I want to know how in the world they look themselves in the mirror every day. Yeah, I know. I mean, I I personally couldn't take a job at any of these companies, but and and again, I mean, it's it's everyone's prerogative whether or not they smoke, but no one is smoking unaware of what it does to our habits. And frankly, when we look at children, right, we do not allow cigarette manufacturers to you know have cartoon characters smoking and and you know during Saturday morning cartoons doing all this kind of stuff with cigarettes, and yet we we do allow the food industry to spend hundreds of millions of dollars per year advertising these uh, other harmful and addictive substances to children. And Carrie, that's particularly disturbing when we live in a free country, right? Obviously, but psychologists have proven that children before the age of eight do not realize that commercials are commercials. They, they just see them as fact. Like, uh, for example, in the Journal of Marketing, conducted a study that showed that 70% of six through eight-year-olds believe that fast foods are healthier than foods prepared at home. I, I'm I'm trying not to laugh here, but I, I got to say I would say that was probably true for like half the adult population. As well. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure that we all watch commercials and yep. start well, no, believing they that they're fairy tales they obviously after work, we yeah. hit the age of eight, because obviously <laughs> they work really, really, really well. Yep. So that yep. just seemed a bit odd to me. But. No, it will, will make sense. No, and, and, and just some further data, though, which may also apply to, to adults. We'll see here, but this is pretty specific to children. So researcher Kelly Brunel at Yale reported, quoting, a study of Australian children ages 9 to 10 indicated that more than half believe that Ronald McDonald knows best what children should eat. And then he went on to report that the average American child sees more than 10,000 food as advertisements each year just on television. Children watching Saturday morning cartoons see a food commercial every five minutes. The vast majority are for sugared cereals, fast foods, soft drinks, sugary and salty snacks, and candy. Between 1976 and 1987, the ratio of high to low sugar ads increased from 5 to 1 to 12.5 to 1. So what's the moral of the story? Carrie, we cannot, like the industry clearly isn't regulating itself and the government isn't helping. It's well, telling why would us, it? It's making money. Oh, exactly, exactly. So Okay, I'm getting upset now. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> we've got to take our sanity back. We have to be the ones responsible for restoring this. And, and I think, you know, understanding the science and then understanding that we can practically apply this and live this is the most effective way to do it. But that's just my two cents. Yes, I'm just thinking it's simple, but it may not necessarily be easy. Uh, well, it, I think at the beginning it won't be super easy because we've been so accustomed to one way of thinking. But I think a, a way to think about it that makes it seem easier is uh, recently updated the Facebook page to say this because it's true and I think it's very compelling. And that's up until 50 years ago, 90% of us avoided obesity, and more than 99% of us avoided diabetes. And no one really dieted, and gyms didn't, like, there were they were not gyms in the 1950s. There were, I mean, obviously there were some at, like, schools, but they weren't on every street corner. So basically for the entire duration of human civilization, until about 50 years ago, we didn't really try. And at most, 10% of the population was obese, and at most, less than 1% of the population was diabetic. So this cannot be complicated. Like, we live in an environment that makes it more difficult, but frankly, we know what to do. We just need to eat the foods we ate before this happened. 
Right. That's it. Like, it's not about this new program. It's not about raspberry ketones or whatever the freaking talk shows that need to fill airtime talk about as the next gimmick. Like, people weren't eating raspberry ketone pills in the 1920s, and that wasn't why no one was obese. The reason why no one was obese and no one was diabetic in the 1920s is because we ate food. We ate things like vegetables and meats and fish and even things like starch, which you know I'm not a big fan of because they're not optimal, but even things like bread and wheat were substantially different. The wheat we eat today is not the wheat we ate in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. It's a completely different species known as dwarf wheat. It has a different chromosomal makeup. It's a different product. All we have to do is do what we did before the problem existed and the problem will no longer exist. The piece where it becomes simple but not easy is where because we have, one, we have to change our understanding, we have to change our thinking, and then because we've all gone down this, you know, we've stepped on the slippery slope, we have to get back from the addictive hold that these substances have had in our body. So that's the, the piece that isn't easy. It's simple, but it's not absolutely, easy. Absolutely. But Jonathan alluded to it earlier, it gets easier. You know, it's like getting the rocket off the ground, right? Once the, the energy you you're need full to of get the rocket off, off the ground <laughs> is huge. But once you're in orbit, it's so much easier. And to it keep will be, it a, it's, it's super easy to keep it there. And actually, there's a wonderful analogy, Carrie, because when we talk about something orbiting, I mean, once it's out there, like satellites just orbit, like the gravity takes care of that. Once you start going sane and once you start feeling how this will make you feel and you start seeing the results it will have, it's not going to be hard to keep it up because it will be a virtuous self-reinforcing cycle. Again, you're going to go through this sugar and starch withdrawal, but you will not be hungry. And in fact, some people are just like, wow, this is just too much food <laughs> in some cases. But really, folks, it's quite simple. It's not necessarily easy at the very beginning, but it is simple and it's something we can keep up for the rest of our lives, which is important. And so just uh, to make sure you have a response to these individuals, uh, when they say something like this, uh, the scientific community has long known that when we talk, yeah, of course, evolution, awesome, it explains everything, it's wonderful. However, for evolutionary changes to actually occur in a species, we're talking like 25,000 to 250,000 years are needed. To put that in perspective, grain was introduced into the human diet at most 12,000 years ago. So this uh, explains a lot about why there are so many people with a gluten intolerance, things like that. Even grain, which many people consider to be like the staff of life and is referred to as the staff of life in the Bible, was introduced in half of the minimum amount of time that would be needed for a population to evolve to handle a new kind of food substance, more likely more like a tenth of the time. So to put it basically, we have not changed, like our biological makeup has not changed, but the quality of our diet has, and it is making us heavy, diabetic, and sick. It's not that we're eating too much. If we're eating too much, the reason we're eating too much is because we're eating the wrong quality of food, and it is stimulating our appetite, and we have to eat more in order to nourish our bodies, because as we talked about earlier, if we're experiencing internal starvation, we're leaking calories into our fat cells, which means we need to eat more calories just to fuel ourselves, not to mention the fact that these insane foods are nutritionally vapid, meaning in order to just get enough nutrition, we have to overeat. You could actually say that overeating is the only way to quote unquote maintain health when you eat the wrong kinds of foods. Because again, if they're nutritionally vapid and if you're leaking calories into your fat cells, how else are you going to nourish yourself? The answer is to change the quality of the diet and just to restore it to what it was before the problem exists, Carrie. It's that, if you just believe that, and if you just understand the science behind that, you will avoid so much shyster, gimmick, quick fix, ridiculous things that are just unnecessary. I think we just need to just give it a two-week shot, right? I mean... Well, I'll give it 21 days. Just 21 to, days. to get over that hump. Absolutely. And then people will see how much easier it becomes once you've gotten over that hump. 
Yeah, so uh, just in one study to reiterate this, a study which was actually pretty cool and unique at the uh, University of Melbourne <clears throat> took some modern hunter-gatherers that they still exist. There are very few, but they still exist. There's, these were middle-aged Australian hunter-gatherers who were, of course, lean and free from any indications of type 2 diabetes because they were living on the foods humans are supposed to be living on. And then switch them to a diet inspired by our you know, government guidelines, a diet that's high in starches and sweets, things like that. Of course, these, every single participant became overweight and showed signs of, of diabetes. They then simply uh, enabled these hunter-gatherers to revert back to their natural diet. And in only seven weeks, the diabetic symptoms went away and they lost 16 and a half pounds. Yeah. And again, they weren't going out of their way to exercise. They weren't dieting. They were just eating. They were just putting the proper fuel into their system. And that's the bottom line is that, for example, uh, Dr. Boyd Eaton from Emory University tells us, quoting, following a diet comparable to the one that humans were genetically adapted to should postpone, mitigate, and in many ways prevent altogether a host of diseases that debilitate us. So Carrie, in the next podcast, let's just, let's do it. Let's start talking about how we can eat more smarter. Yay! Yay! Any closing comments, Carrie? No. No. None. <laughs> no. I not. just want to get on to the next podcast. Do you just want to go get like a giant soda and no. some Skittles? No, and just... I don't. <laughs> I'm, and I got to tell you, listeners, that Jonathan he does a very cute thing. Whenever we come to do podcasts, he brings me an empty cup, a cup of water, and a can of sparkling water, and it's very cute. And he does it every week. <laughs> Yeah, so if you ever come to be a guest on the Smarter Science of Slim podcast, I will also bring you sparkling water. So wonderful. And it's sugar free. So it's sugar free. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Next week, we're going to get into the nitty and gritty of how to eat more but smarter. Jonathan Baylor, Carrie Brown, Living the Smarter Science of Slim. Have a good week. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. If you like the podcast and if there's other ways we can help you, please join us in the Smarter Science of Slim support group, which is freely available at the Smarter Science of Slim website, smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll find all kinds of free recipes and success stories and just all kinds of fun stuff, like how to help your kids go sane and just great community content. And just one last thing before you go, if you wouldn't mind heading over to iTunes and up onto Amazon.com and leaving us a review and then going over to Facebook and liking us, we would hugely appreciate it. 